the first uh, peer public seminar of the spring semester. Um, we have a really impressive lineup of speakers this semester, starting off with Catherine Strunk from Michigan State today. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to make a brief uh, you know, announcement that the peer um, fellowship application window has opened. Um, so um, uh, um, Ashley has put up information on, on the, um, the peer uh, program on the, on the screen. But you know, as many of you know, the program it trains Harvard doctoral students on uh, how to do quantitative education research with um, agencies. Um, we're open to students from, from GSE, HKS, as well as FAS. Um, and, um, but for students who are in G1 or G2 uh, are encouraged to apply. Um, if you have any questions about the program, please di direct them to Ashley Dixon at the peer fellowship email on, on, on this slide. Okay, um, so this session is being recorded. Uh, so, so please keep that in mind when you ask questions. Um, I'd also like to just share uh, uh, expectations uh, for this event. So as usual, you, you can ask um, clarifying questions throughout the um, presentation, but please save substantive questions um, until the end. Um, if you're participating via Zoom, use the hand raise function. Um, uh, and I, I will uh, you know, moderate uh, questions. If you're viewing via YouTube, submit your questions on Twitter at um, number sign peer seminar or email the uh, Ashley Dixon at the peer fellowship um, email uh, uh, and um, she'll share them with us. So now I just want to introduce uh, Catherine Strunk, who, who's joining us today. Catherine is Professor of Education, Policy, and Economics um, and the Clifford E. Erickson Distinguished Chair in Education at Michigan State. Um, she's Faculty Director of the Education Policy Innovation Collaborative. Um, and their research focuses on um, uh, working with local and state education agencies. And she's gonna be talking about a big project they've been doing with the Michigan Department of Education um, uh, today. So, um, so Catherine, um, thanks, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the peer seminar. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Awesome, thank you for having me. And let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, okay, can you guys all see a very bright green screen? Okay. And it's, I it's Sparty. <laughs> it is, it's very Spartan. Um, and I should say at the outset, I can't see you all if you raise your hands. And so I hope Tom or Ashley, you're checking to see if there are questions people have along the way and just shout out. Um, yeah. I'll worry that people are bored and falling asleep if people don't ask questions. Um, so quickly, on, as Tom said, uh, I'm Catherine Strunk. I'm thrilled to be here. I wish I could see you all in person. It would be much more fun, but I'm glad to have a different day than I've been having every single day for the last 10 months. Um, this is going to be a talk about some work we're doing in EPIC uh, with, in partnership with the Department of Education in Michigan. Uh, it's the second of four year of, in our evaluation of the Michigan partnership model, which is the state's ESSA state uh, district and school turnaround. Given the audience, I really wanted to just quickly kind of give you some background on EPIC because I think it's sort of similar to what you all are doing at PEER. Um, EPIC is the research partner to the Department of Education in Michigan. And we are an independent and nonpartisan center. And that I think is really critical in the world of education research these days. Um, we are devoted to what we call research with consequence, which is the idea that we can do research that's both rigorous and intended to kind of be really applicable and improve education policy and teachers and students' lives pretty quickly. 
uh, we do conduct original research and we try to use more than just um, causal analysis and advanced statistical modeling. We also try to use surveys, interviews, case studies to really produce insights that folks can use to create policy and implement policy and improve policy that's already in place. When I got to MSU almost four years ago, three and a half years ago, I was pretty quickly in a conversation with the Department of Education about this new model that they are putting into place, this new turnaround reform. Um, and they said, you know, we really need you to study this for us and help us understand that this is working, how it's working, for whom, where, why, when, all the questions. And this is what they wrote um, about why they had asked us to do this. And I wanted to kind of talk about this because I think it's really important when you're partnering with an agency to think about why they want you to do the evaluation, why they want you to do the study. And so this was actually from the deputy state superintendent who was our research partner in the work originally. And she had said, you know, we basically have been doing all these things, but in a very disparate, disconnected and constantly changing approach to help our lowest performing schools and districts. And they knew they weren't really enacting what was research-based and trying to evaluate its implementation and kind of do a continuous improvement process. And she called it a less measured and more reactionary approach to what they were, had been doing and they wanted to do this differently. And they saw the opportunity to kind of pilot what EPIC has now become to do this kind of research in real time. So she said, we needed ongoing evidence while we were implementing the model instead of awaiting do it after the fact analysis when the state had already moved on to another approach. She went on to say that they were committed to using research and evaluation to drive decision-making and policy implementation efforts. And she noted that's an easy thing to say that she wanted to be able to quote, walk the talk. And so they were really, really invested in having us not just be yes men and not just be people who are saying, you're doing a great job, keep it up, but actually really independently and rigorously evaluate the efforts. They did put money behind this. Um, they provided us with a contract to do some of this work. And we also got uh, philanthropic funding to do quite a bit of the work as well. So a quick overview of what partnership model is, and we'll go into more depth in a second, but this was launched in the spring of 2017. We didn't start our evaluation until fall of 2017. So we missed kind of the very beginning. Um, and the first implementation was in the 17-18 school year. This was part of Michigan's ESSA's plan for school accountability, support and improvement. And what they did was they identified the lowest performing districts by identifying the lowest performing 5% of schools in the state. And so they said, these are the lowest performing schools and every single district that houses one of these schools is going to become a partnership district. And within those districts are these partnership schools that are the schools that are needing to kind of turn around. Uh, and districts were told that they had to develop a needs assessment and a plan, and that they would have to then kind of do these things that they identified in their plans that they needed to do to improve student outcomes over a three-year period with some check-ins between. And the Department of Education, and particularly the Office of Partnership Districts within the Department of Education, would provide some support and monitoring of the progress. To this time, they've done three rounds of partnership identification. They did the spring of 2017 when the first group was picked. They quickly picked a second group in the fall of 2017. And they also picked another group in the spring of 2018. The fall, the spring of 2017 is the um, first cohort. And then the fall and spring 2017-18 districts are the second cohort because they didn't start implementing until the 18-19 school year. They were intending to pick a fourth round this fall um, that has been hampered by what everything else in the world has been hampered by. And so we are currently working with them to think about how do they best pick a fourth round of partnership districts now that they don't have some of the things they were selecting on before like test scores and improvement metrics. Um, the numbers in terms of the numbers of districts and schools change as districts kind of come in and out of the reform a little bit. And I'll talk about that later. At the time, there was 123 schools and 36 districts across both cohorts. Um, again, the there are some basic components of the partnership model that are really important to understand. The first is that districts were to work to craft what they called a partnership agreement, which is basically a school improvement plan with another name. And what they were supposed to do here is really deep dive in their districts and schools and do a needs assessment where they understood what the strengths of their districts and schools were and what the weaknesses were. They then identified the goals that they needed to achieve and they outlined how they were gonna get towards those goals at an 18 and 36 month benchmark. And they also had to name the consequences that would happen if they didn't achieve those goals. Notably, this was a compromise position. So, the governor at the time, Rick Snyder, really wanted to close down a set of schools that he felt were underperforming and were not, didn't, weren't going to be improving quickly enough and put those kids in other schools. 
the superintendent at the time, Superintendent Whiston, did not want to close all the schools. And there was also just huge community backlash, as we know there tends to be around school closure. And so Superintendent Whiston said, look, let's try something else for three years. Let's do this thing called the partnership model. Let's see if we can turn these schools around. And let's, if we have to close them at the end of that, we will. But there are also other consequences that were kind of high stakes that were at the end of this. And districts were supposed to kind of choose their own in terms of what the consequences were. Um, the district, sorry, the department and the Office of Partnership Districts within the department then provided what they call a partnership agreement liaison, which I kind of think it was a concierge. So this is a person in the department who is there to help. And there, some of the department, some of the liaisons only have one district. Um, if they're a very big district, most have a couple of districts that they're working with. And what they're trying to do is facilitate uh, conversations between the district or the schools and the supports that they need to improve. And so this person is devoted to sort of helping them think through, how do we get funding? How do we use the funds that were allocated? There's only $6 million allocated in each year. I think in one year there was $7 million with all the districts, not a lot of money to go around. So how do we use those funds? Um, how do we connect you to people that are capacity builders? How do we connect you to the right PD? So these people were kind of problem solvers. Um, they also administer these six or $7 million a year of 21H grant funds for the partnership districts. They also had regional assistance grants, which are smaller funds that went to what we call in Michigan intermediate school districts, which are basically kind of like county district counties, which are um, intermediate associations. And they're the ones who, you know, many, many, many districts in one ISD and they provide things like PD, special ed services, things like that. And so the RAG grants would go through the ISD and intended to trickle down to the partnership districts. Um, then the department was also in charge of monitoring and evaluating the goal attainment of these districts, and they could release schools and districts from partnership if they achieved their goals at the end of 36 months, or they could implement next level accountability, these high stakes consequences if they did not achieve their goals. The ISDs in the original version of the partnership model really were limited to kind of using these RAG funds to support districts turnaround efforts, um, and they were intended to be one of the many partners in the partnership model. I kind of want to point out who these districts are. Um, and this is something that I think is really important to understand from a context perspective. These districts enroll many, many more low-income Black and Hispanic students than do other Michigan school districts. We use Hispanic, that's the name of the, in the data that, that Michigan collects. Um, so so uh, they're basically almost 14 times as many um, Black students than white students to be enrolled in a partnership district. So they're 13.8 times more likely. Um, and they're 54 times more likely than white students to attend a partnership school. So I think that's really critical to understand. Black students are 14 times more likely to be in a partnership district than a white student and 54 times more likely than white students to attend a partnership school. Similarly, Latino, Latina students, five times more likely to be in a partnership district and 10 times more likely to be in a partnership school. This is where the partnership this is where the low-income and minority kids in Michigan go to school. So we asked sort of five major questions over this four-year evaluation. In the second year, these are the ones that we focused on, these parts of the five questions. The first is, you know, how has the partnership model changed over time? In the first year, we wanted to really get into what was the model, because while it was sort of in Superintendent Wiston's head and some of the MDE staff's heads, it wasn't necessarily laid down on paper. They didn't have like a theory of change that they were working with that they were describing to their districts. And so one of the things we wanted to do from the beginning was just say, what even is this intervention? What does it look like? And then in year two, we said, okay, now how has it changed in the two years? Um, we also wanna know, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, one, one quick clarifying question. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you that, that came in through the chat was, it's from Ebony uh, Bridwell Mitchell, um, who's asking, are the districts fully nested within the liaisons or do some liaisons work across multiple districts? Yeah, good yeah. question. So some liaisons work across multiple districts. Yeah, and again, it's the bigger districts that are often with one, one liaison to one big district like Detroit. And then some of the smaller districts have one liaison for many small districts, like usually three or four, yeah. Um, I can think of where you're going with that, Ebony. So make sure you save the question about that till the very end. <laughs> so um, we wanted to know how partnership had changed education and partnership schools and districts, what had happened. 
And then we wanted to understand how this reform is being implemented. So you can ask the kind of impact e questions in, in question number two, but then we wanted to understand a little bit more about what did this even look like? So not just did it work, but how is it rolling out in these districts? Um, question four came about actually as a result of our first year study. Um, we kept on hearing in the first year that human capital challenges were just huge across all of the districts. And they were all talking about how difficult it was to recruit and retain uh, and reward really high quality teachers and leaders. And this actually had major trickle down effects into how they could implement the reform. And so in year two, we really wanted to focus a lot more on the human capital challenges and understand how districts were addressing them. And we also kind of wanted to know what are the other major challenges or things that are mediating the turnaround effort. So I'm not gonna show you any equations today and I'm not gonna show you equations because we don't often show our partners equations, right? They're in the report. They, they wanna be able to read them. There are people in the department who are very, very strong methodologically. Um, but when we talk to the districts themselves or to the policymakers usually, we kind of talk them through the intuition behind the models that we're gonna use as well as the other data we're collecting and methods we're using. And we don't usually show up to the Greek, right? The Greek often loses people. And so here's kind of the data methods that we use in this study. You can see we do a lot. Um, we do have access to the state administrative data. We have about 9 million student years of student data records and about 575 educator years of educator administrative records. We use event studies to analyze this, right? So we're basically looking and saying, look, look at the partnership schools um, that were selected for, for identification. And then let's basically pick the schools that were next to be selected. So the ones that were nearly selected, but weren't. And so kind of the next on the list of low performing schools, if you rank them. And we use that as the control and we use the actual treated schools as the treatment. And then we look at the differences over time, right? In the year of implementation and beyond. And we compare identification year. If any of you read the 270 page report that I found out ahead of time, I know Tom did, so he may be the only one, um, that you'll see that we actually, in various models, use identification year or use the year before identification. And what I'm going to show you today, we use identification year as the, as the reference year. Um, we also surveyed all of the educators in partnership districts. So again, this, the schools that were partnership schools were nested inside partnership districts. And so not all the district schools in the partnership districts were treated. They were kind of treated by the spillover effect, which we'll talk about in a second, but they weren't treated in terms of all the interventions going straight to them. And so we surveyed all the partnership school teachers and principals and all the non-partnership schools teachers and principals inside partnership districts. Um, you can see that in the fall of 2018, we had about a 38% response rate from teachers that was up to 49% in fall of 2019. Um, for principals, we had about a 30, went up to 40%. We think it's important that the response rate went up over the two years. And part of why we think this happened is because we provided back to the districts reports on kind of some of the main constructs from our surveys. And we said, you know, here's how you look compared to the average partnership school. Um, and we know from principals and, and superintendents that they found this actually really useful and they were able to see some of the value and what we were doing pretty quickly. We also did a lot of reporting to them, talking about how their voices were being heard. And they also, and we'll show it at the end, we also had every year the Department of Education releases a statement when we put out our report about what they learned and what they're gonna do differently as a result. And so we were able to show that educators in these districts, look, we're actually using these surveys, it's not a waste of your time. And we think that's what helped to drive our response rates up. Um, Last spring was a fun time for all of us. And we uh, also did a COVID survey at the request of the Department of Education to understand what was happening inside school districts last March and April and May. And so we did um, a quick COVID survey and you'll see we'll use some of that at the very end of this, of this presentation. But that's not all. We also um, interviewed every single superintendent who would talk to us. So that was 22 of them in both years, not the same 22 in each year. Um, and so that was 22 out of 36. Uh, we also did case studies in three sites in each year. Um, they're not, not one, one of the sites was the same and two sites were different. And we mostly use again, the second year survey, uh, the second year case studies and the second year leader interviews in this presentation. Um, this is because we really wanted to understand what the superintendents were telling us and then be able to go deeper into the districts and the schools and say, what were teachers and principals thinking and doing more than we could get out of just the survey. 
We also did a bunch of document analysis and we watched three of the goal attainment meetings, which are the meetings where there's kind of interim checkpoints on their ability to meet the goals that they've set for themselves. Okay, so the first question is how has the partnership model changed over time? This was the first theory of change. Um, I don't know about all of you, but one of the things that I like to do pretty early on is I like to ask the, dis the, the Department of Education or whatever the partner is that we're working with, you know, what was your intention? How did you think this was gonna work? And you'll often find that people don't agree. Um, one person thought it was gonna work one way or they really wanted to stress one thing. The other people wanted to stress something else or thought that was more important. And what we try to do at the beginning of each of our projects is come to sort of theory of change that is what the policymakers who are implementing the reform think that they're doing. So here's what we came to with, with a lot of conversations with MDE folks over quite a bit of time. Um, what's happening in the green box is the actual reform itself. And so here we go, the bottom 5% of schools are identified by MDE as low performing. They have to go through this partnership agreement um, development and then implement it. And importantly to everybody we talk to, the district is the driver of change. And so even though it's the school that's being identified for treatment, the superintendent of public instruction, Superintendent Whiston said, you know, it's not like a high school is failing and the elementary school is doing great. If you don't get to a high school that's really struggling if the elementary and middle school are you know, hitting out of the ballpark. So it's a district effect. It's not just an individual school effect. And we wanna make sure that we're providing the district with the treatment as well so that they can, they can address the systematic issues that are happening within it. So that was a, a really important piece. Another important piece was letting the local district do its own needs assessment. So it wasn't MDE with a heavy hand coming in and saying, I need you to fill out every single box and these are the things, the areas we want you to hit. They're saying, here are some general guidelines and they worked with them through it, but they said, you should do this needs assessment. In the original uh, version of the, of the model, they were doing it in partnership with both the MD and OPD, but also these ISDs, these you know, intermediate school districts, and also they wanted community partners. So the big idea here was that you needed community buy-in to improve a district in a school. And so they wanted you know, philanthropies, boys and girls clubs, nonprofits, churches, religious organizations. They wanted everybody to come to the table and buy into the same sort of needs assessment and then offer assistance to get out of it. And they had to, in the first year of this, they had to actually show how they were involving the community and these community organizations in the reform plan. Um, they drafted their goals for 18 and 36 months. They developed the strategies aligned to those goals. Then they aligned the supports they wanted from MD and the ISDs for that, and they identified the community partners. By doing all of this, it was supposed to then lead to these sort of near-term outcomes at both the district and the school level. First, doing this needs assessment and aligning these strategies to the goals and then executing on them they thought would improve the systems in the districts and kind of improve capacity in the district to support the functions that are really important to operations. So things like human resources, curriculum and instruction, operations, how to use data to inform you know, practice. And by fixing stuff at the district level that would then help the school level um, also improved its functions and help to turn around the schools. Once this had happened, I thought that would lead to some intermediate outcomes like keeping their teachers, um, being able to recruit teachers, having consistent high quality instruction and be able to use their resources more efficiently, which should then lead to improve academic and whole child outcomes, which are the things they were being held accountable for at the end of three years. You see in the bottom right-hand corner here, this kind of shaded like light gray box, which was these consequences for failure to improve. And they could pick between reconstruction, which is not always what we think of as reconstruction, which is basically they were sort of shutting down, uh, you could shut down your high school say and restart it. Um, it or you could have closure, or you could just do a general restart with a charter school. You could have the ISD takeover, or you could have a CEO appointed. Um, this is in this light gray box here because they really tried not to make this the point of the reform. This was three years out, and this was not about high stakes accountability at first. This was supposed to be about support to improve. This is all within these local and state contexts, which are always incredibly important when you think about any kind of district reform. Here's how it changed though. The community partners didn't work. So by year two, we could see that the, the districts had tried to build these community partnerships and they spent a lot of time trying to get these community partners on board. And it was a lot of cooks in the kitchen. You know, we actually had quotes saying, 
too many cooks in the kitchen. It's hard to get them on board. They want to do what they want to do to help. And they don't actually want to do what we need them to do to help. And we don't want to tell these people who are offering help, sorry, no thanks. So it was creating a lot of problems for them actually to try to build in these community partners. And it was a lot of sort of inconsistency. So some districts had community partners that could be super helpful. And many districts didn't have anyone in the community that could really step up and help the way they needed. Um, the role of the MDE liaison became even more important. So this kind of concierge became more part of the implicit theory of change than it had been even in the beginning. And in particular, the ISDs, these kind of intermediate school districts became hugely important. They were the kind of professional development. They did a lot of training and coaching and especially for the charter schools in this reform who had never gotten to work with the ISDs before. These ISDs became sort of really strong partners for them in improvement efforts. Um, MDE also systematized a lot of processes. So they made it so they could amend the partnership agreements that kind of in a way that would make more sense but to the district. Oftentimes you had superintendent or principal turnover between year one and year two, and the superintendents were like, I didn't write that plan. So they let them come in and make the amendments they wanted to make. And they, they made the evaluation process, sort of the interim statement and the kind of end of three-year process much more explicit and clear. So that all changed. None of the outcomes that they were hoping to achieve changed, but the reform itself. And they took even another step back and tried to even make the high stakes consequences even less part of the reform. They were there at the end, but they tried to say, this is really about support and intervention. This is not about, you know, we're gonna close you down if you don't reach your goals. So how did partnership change um, in partnership schools and districts? So here we're gonna first look at these long-term outcomes, um, the improve, and we'll focus on the improved academic outcomes. So here are the coefficient plots from our uh, event study. This is for the cohort one. We don't stack our cohorts. Um, so we have two years of outcomes. Again, was implemented in um, 17, 18, and 18, 19, identified in 16, 17. Um, and we show it for math and ELA. We do it for all of our outcomes, which I'll show you in a second. And you can see, you know, it's sort of messy in the pre-trends, but nothing too bad. Um, and then you see some hints that an ELA in at least especially year one you see uh, positive effects in, in year one for ELA. Um, I should note, we do at both levels and gains run. So we do just the right hand side, the left hand side has the um, math or ELA achievement score and we control on the right hand side for the previous year score. We also run it as a gain with a delta on the left hand side. Um, we use the gain scores in most of our descriptions to the state and policymakers. So this is what we show our policymaker partners um, in our, you know, in the presentations of them. We have everything, all the tables and stuff in the report, but this is how we, we talk to them about here's what the impacts were in cohort one. Um, we would talk them through, you know, here's what the significance means. And we show, look, and for this is just cohort one. Now green bars are year one, blue bars are year two. These are just for the gain score outcomes. And we say, look, for math and ELA, we see, you know, it looks like in year one. Um, there were positive gains in both math and ELA, but at math, it was only significant at 0.1. Um, the magnitudes are pretty consistent across both years, a little bit less big in year two and only marginally significant in ELA. We don't see anything happening really in math SAT scores at all. So these are the higher levels. These are cohort level models. But in ELA SAT scores, we see a pretty big bump in year two. So something seems to be happening that's on average more positive in the partnership schools for cohort one. And this is again, relative to the non-partnership non -partnership schools that were nearly selected. And all relative to the identification year. One thing that's important in Michigan that we needed to remember is that Detroit Public Schools Community District is the biggest district in the state. Um, it's also the most sort of infamous and famous both. Um, and a key thing for us here is Detroit came out of State takeover right around the exact same time partnership took place. And so we didn't want to think, we didn't, we were worried that Detroit was sort of skewing our effects and making, um, it was really a more Detroit story than anything else. We weren't totally wrong. So we still saw our positive effects, um, but DPSCD was really driving them. Here we can, we can, we uh, compare DPSCD partnership schools to DPSCD non-partnership schools the ones that were the closest to being selected. So we just compare within the district. We're not comparing to district to schools outside the district. And we wanna do that because again, we were worried about getting a DPSCD effect 
and not a partnership effect. Also, in addition to coming out of state takeover, there was the first board hired superintendent coming on right as partnership was coming on, Dr. Nikolai Vidi. He's been a very public figure in Michigan and in the district. Um, and he has he's really pushed through a bunch of reforms, both under the partnership as, and also not as part of partnership. So he wanted to know sort of of he, what he was doing, what was the partnership piece and not just the kind of Dr. Vidi effect. And what you can see here is pretty sizable gains. These are in standard deviation units um, in math and ELA grades three through eight and also in the ELA SAT. So the kids in Detroit partnership schools seem to really be improving. Here are for the whole cohort one, not just DPSCD. This is for everyone. These are the high school graduation, dropout and grade retention outcomes. Again, these are cohort models. Um, and we see very little happening. For Detroit, we see a lot more happening in cohort one. So high school graduation rates improved quite a bit and especially in um, year two. Dropout rates declined substantially. Grade retention, we don't see a lot happening. It's significant, but very small uh, decrease in grade retention in year one. Um, not part of this year's study, but we will say after year one, we went back to Detroit and asked Dr. Vidi if we could, you know, everyone was anonymous in our qualitative work. And we said, could we actually get you on the record, not anonymous, to talk about what happened in Detroit? Because this is kind of an exceptional story. And it was really interesting to have him reflect, and it's in our year one report, have him reflect on sort of once he was able to see the data, like what did he do differently in partnership schools versus non-partnership schools? And he was able to think through some of the things he had done around teachers and students inside these schools particularly. And not because so much they were partnership schools, but because they were the lowest performing schools that he was more worried about. Here's the cohort two models. Um, not a lot significant happening and we only have one year of data. Like everyone else, I'm sure we don't, we're not gonna have a second year of data for this cohort. Um, and Michigan has asked for a waiver from test scores this year. So if that's granted, we won't have another year of data either. So this might be it. Um, but what we see is, you know, looks slightly positive in year one, which 2019, but it's not really significant except for marginally on math in the levels. And so here's how you see that in the sort of graphs that we showed um, the partnership districts and, and this MDE. Um, since maybe tiny but not significant gains at all in math and ELA, looks like pretty negative but not significant decreases in math and ELA SAT scores for cohort two. So Catherine, what, like, so if, I'm just wondering, is this a cohort one versus cohort two story or is this a Detroit story? Like, yeah, you know, so. I think so, it's both. <laughs> so but, cohort but, one seemed to do better even when you take out Detroit than cohort two. Um, and Detroit did better, and here's the Detroit slide for this. Detroit did better than other districts did in partnership across both cohorts. Um, and we don't really, we, we're trying to get at an answer for why we think cohort one fared better. We don't actually have a good one. Um, you know, the MDE actually put a lot into place between year one and year two that they thought were going to be improving on what was happening in the district, um, in the districts that for cohort two, uh, but it just, it, it didn't seem to actually affect cohort two in the same way. Um, one, of our, one of our hypotheses that it's hard to test is a scalability problem. And this came actually back to us from my time in LA Unified too, when I studied to turn our intervention there. And I remember talking to someone in the district and saying, you know, what's the problem? Why isn't this showing greater gains, especially in the later cohorts of district, of schools, and she said, you know, it's really hard to do turnaround and to support turnaround. And she thought in LA they could do five a year well. And so here we are with 100 plus districts and I, 100 plus schools and 30 plus districts. And I think it's a big challenge for, you know, I think state agencies are pretty understaffed and there wasn't a ton of money going to this. And so there wasn't a ton of resources to bring in and actually scale up the supports that may have been needed. But that's, again, that's a hypothesis. It's not something you can really test. Here are the outcomes for the high school dropout and grade retention for the overall cohort two. Not a lot here in Detroit either. 
Okay, so that's the, you know, in, quote unquote impact story. Um, so the question is, okay, what was happening in these districts in the year two of the study? Um, so we're looking at these sort of more near term outcomes, what was actually going on? So one of the really interesting things we heard in year two that we didn't hear as much in year one was that partnership was really facilitating their strategic planning efforts. And so they were telling the superintendents and the principals were telling us, look, what we're able to do as a part of partnership is this needs assessment work and this partnership agreement work makes us identify these really critical goals and then makes us have a data driven instruction and a continuous improvement cycle to do this. And then we have we have to be able to communicate this because we have to tell MDE what we're doing. And we have to also tell our principals what we're doing. And so it makes us have improved communication kind of externally and internally. And we heard this on the majority of district leaders that talked about this. And um, it was sort of a, a very consistent conversation we were having with the superintendents the whole, the whole study. Um, so one of the things that I think has come out in some of the literature on school turnaround has been that there's a lot of plans flying around, right? There's like your ESSA turnaround plan, and then there's your school improvement plan, maybe there's a district improvement plan, and then Michigan may have something called the blueprint. There's all these things that they're supposed to be planning, and there's a lot of conversation around like this is a lot of compliance and not a lot of oomph. But one thing that the liaisons and the, and the ISD coaches really helped these districts do as part of partnership was to think about how to build a coherent strategic plan that could kind of assume all those other plans. And so each plan was sort of a part of this larger, broader strategic plan. And so here we have a charter school leader telling us, we first built a strategic plan, then we built the partnership agreement you know, from that plan, and that's still a subset of our strategic plan. So here are the things that they're focusing on for partnership. These are the goals that they're gonna be held accountable for, but it's all in sort of um, an effort to achieve these longer term strategic goals that might be longer than the three years that they have for partnership. Same thing from this other charter leader. I should have said at the beginning, we have a hockey fan on our team. So all of our districts are hockey teams. I don't know anything about hockey, even though I lived in Michigan for three and a half years. So I don't know if these are good teams or not, but. But um, you, there's not literally a district called blues. Or no, players. Like you, are, you, you, you just gave them hockey names. Yep. Um, and you know, we do that to promise uh, anonymity so that they speak to us I mean, I'm sure all of you who do qualitative work know this, that they speak to us freely. We do tell them, you know, sometimes if you say something that's really obvious, we can't hide who you are. Um, but we, we tried to not use things that were identifiable, except for that one instance with Detroit when we really wanted to go back to Dr. Beauty and understand what had happened there. By the way, I think there's a star hockey player named Patrick Kane, by the way. <laughs> Is he your sibling and cousin? Long, I, long? I, so I have a sibling named Patrick Kane, but... <laughs> It's not a hockey player. Not a hockey player. Um, you now know mo one more hockey player than I know. Um, so the charter leader from Flyers said, you know, our goals are shaped by those, meaning the policy requirements and the school needs. Um, and then we mix them together and to accomplish those goals. So we're meeting both the kind of requirements of the accountability system, but also really what we need as a school. Um, and they really talked about how that was a critical piece, that they didn't want the accountability, just compliance, but that they were actually using this accountability system to push them forward towards their goals. And they felt that partnership enabled them to do that in a way that some other accountability systems may not. So here we have quotes about how they were using their data um, and how they were really using data to, to kind of do a, an improvement cycle and to inform their instruction and practice. And so here we have some leaders talking about how the goal setting and evaluation process really led them to be able to use their data better. Um, so this Rangers charter leader told us, you know, it's beneficial. It made us really, you know, we had all the data. We just didn't have, have to aggregate it because we had it and we could put it together in one place. And that was a really good thing. Um, this other district leader tells us that the sensitivity to data had increased tenfold in their partnership school. Another leader told us that, you know, they were making them look at the reading and the math scores and the, they were giving those at the classroom teachers and the class teachers are working with a coach that they had purchased through their partnership funds to help them bridge the gap between what they thought should be happening in the classroom with the data said that was happening. Um, so here's some of our survey data. We, we again surveyed the partnership and non-partnership school teachers and principals. So the dark green are the partnership teachers, the light green are the non-partnership teachers. 
And we asked, these are from different items in the survey. And so we don't have this actual scale at the bottom, um, but you can imagine a one is very low, a five is very high. Um, and we asked them how much they had changed their focus in their school from the previous year to this year, and how much the focus on the data use had changed relative to last year. <clears throat> and you can see that partnership teachers, first of all, all the teachers in the district sort of always had a better than average response. It was always to some extent this thing had changed. The partnership teachers in particular believe that they were focusing more on the use of data. Um, we also asked them about their principal's effectiveness in using dev evidence to make data-driven decisions relative to last year. And again, we see um, you know, better improvement on that from the partnership teachers, but still better than average from all of them. And then we asked them still though, you know, would you, to what extent would you actually benefit from increased assistance? And we had a list of things. And here's one with um, on instruction driven by student achievement data. And teachers said they could still definitely use assistance in that. Okay, so here is another uh, piece of our survey data on one of the things that they focused on. And one thing we heard a lot about in their strategic plans was clearly they were identified for academic performance and they wanted to really focus on improving academic performance. And so here we have a graph and we try to think really hard about how do you show two years of survey data, the change over time, plus the individual years. And so the green, dark green are partnership teachers, light green are non-partnership teachers, purple are partnership principals, light purple are non-partnership principals. And then the gray bars show us the change from year one to where the dot ends is year two. And the key takeaway here is that these are all areas about academic performance and you see that they were saying that they were focusing more than they had the year before on academic performance pretty much throughout. And that especially for partnership principals, they were saying this had increased from the previous year. So especially in assessments, they said they were um, focusing more on assessments, more on curriculum and instruction, um, more on academic improvement for students at the, at the cusp of state test level. The majority of our district leaders and our superintendent interviews told us that they were increasing their focus on some of these really important instructional core things like curriculum, uh, building teachers instructional capacities and enhancing teacher recruitment and retention. Um, I'll let you guys quickly read one or pick a quote, any quote, and just take a quick second to read it. But these are from our district leaders talking about their focus on academic performance. And the key thing here again is curriculum. They were talking about curriculum. The STARS district put into place instructional rounds, which they had identified as something they could need to do to help build the capacity of their teachers. So they had teachers go to each other's rooms to be able to understand what was working and what wasn't working and then give feedback. So they were really trying to increase their focus on how do we improve instruction and academic outcome. Another thing we heard from about half of our leaders was a focus on student and family engagement. So we heard a lot about, you know, we have to make sure that these kids feel comfortable and these families feel comfortable in our school so they want to be here so that they improve attendance and so that they actually can achieve higher and better in, in school and whole child outcomes. And so, you know, 11 of our leaders talked about this in their interviews on their own. We didn't ask them about it specifically. And lastly, we're really working to improve culture and climate. And so a lot of our district leaders told us we're really focusing on culture and climate. We asked that in our survey as well. So here you can see the survey responses and you can see that principals in particular from partnership districts were focusing more on after school programs than they had in the year before, attendance interventions, student behavioral interventions, socio emotional outcomes for kids and family and community engagement. Okay, so I don't wanna to go too long, so I'm gonna to try to get through the rest of this, but I wanna kind of quickly talk about human capital. This has been a huge challenge for low performing schools across the country, and we saw that in Michigan too. So here's just a descriptive line graph. This is not a model-based graph at all. Um, the green line at the top are cohort one partnership schools. The dark blue line are cohort two partnership schools. The blue dotted line are the non-partnership schools that are in partnership districts. And the purple dotted line is the state average. And we show you kind of cohort one, two, identification year and treatment years. Um, and what you can see pretty seriously here is that the cohort one and two partnership schools have really problematic exit rates. They're substantially higher than the state average and even than the average of the non-partnership schools in the same partnership districts, hovering at around a 30% turnover rate. And 
it's not just about turnover, it's about recruitment. So you hear we have one district leader saying something that we heard almost every district leader tell us that for every opening used to get 40 applicants, 10 of whom were very hireable, five of whom were probably great, talking up to like five years ago, and now you're lucky to get one, extremely lucky to get two or three, and incredibly lucky if one of them is really actually a hireable candidate. So it's interesting because we had a report in Michigan a few years ago by another organization that said there wasn't a shortage of teachers in Michigan because we were producing more teachers than we could hire. But this is actually showing us that um, even though we might have five applicants, most of them weren't ones that we felt could, we could be hiring into these districts, either for quality or other reasons. So, so Catherine, sorry, just a quick clarification question. So when you're saying 25 or 30 percent turnover, you're not talking about turnover among early career teachers. You mean 25, 30 percent of the entire teaching force. Yep. Exiting from the school in these from these schools and partnership schools. So this wow. is a huge problem. And one thing we talked yeah. about in our year one report is actually that um, think about what happens when you have that kind of turnover? It's not just like, how do I put a new good teacher in front of my kids? But also if you're trying to implement curricular reform, how do you possibly implement curricular reform if you have to retrain a quarter of your teachers every year, right? And so we heard a lot of districts telling us, you know, I bought this great curriculum and I did all the PD and then I had 25 of my teachers leave. And so then I would have to go do it again the next year. I don't have the money to do it every single year. And so some districts said, you know, I just went and bought an out-of-the-box curriculum that was just sort of like a scripted curriculum, because at least then if there was a new teacher or a sub, that teacher could pick up on page 40 on day four, you know, and we knew where it needed to be. And so that's not the kind of curriculum we think of as the curriculum we want for these kids, but the districts didn't feel like they had any real options at that point. Here's some uh, data on hiring difficulties. These are principals. Uh, we show in 2018, 19 and 1920, and we ask about the hiring difficulty at their school this year and at their district this year. So even though the picture we just showed you is really bad, um, partnership principals in these partnership districts looked like that they were actually improving over time. Um, so that's on the left and the, you know, we, they basically say, you know, yeah, there are difficulties, but they're, they're less difficult to, to hiring this year than last year. Um, not so much in the district though. So the schools are saying easier to hire relative to last year, but the district is having greater problems. Um, here's some just questions on teacher recruitment from our survey. These are again, just for principals. And they talk about a lot of things that sort of negatively impacted their ability to recruit and hire teachers. You can kind of go down that list. They felt like the culture and the climate was problematic. They felt like the you know, SES status of the community was, was problematic. But the thing that really stood out was compensation, teacher salaries. Um, again, we didn't ask leaders like, is compensation a problem? We just said, tell us some of the problems with hiring and recruitment. And uh, over half told us that compensation was a huge challenge with recruitment. And you see it in the surveys from the principals too. So they were doing things to try to overcome this. So um, about half of the leaders in our, in our interviews on their own volunteered that they were doing. Half of the leaders told us they were using salary increases, signing bonuses, financial incentives that they were paying for out of the 21H funds to help recruit teachers. Even just like a couple thousand dollar bonus that they could get a teacher to come work for them. Um, a number were implementing grow your own programs. So they were implementing programs that were trying to get subs or um, to become credentialed or they were attracting new interns and helping them develop into teachers. They were partnering with universities to try to get their pair pros trained. They were trying to sort of bring in teachers that would understood the culture and the climate of the district and were willing to stay there, that weren't going to just leave. Um, and again, same thing, but they were trying to attract these, what they called right fit. A lot of them said right fit teachers that um, they were trying to say, I don't know, maybe it's not the quote unquote best teacher on paper, but one that understands who we are and is going to stay. So here are our event study models looking at teacher retention as an outcome for cohort one. Um, so here, the, uh, these are the beta coefficients. The blue lines are for out of district transfer, the probability of leaving the district. And um, the green squares are probability of actually exiting the profession. So leaving the data in Michigan altogether. Um, and you can see that uh, the pre-trends aren't, aren't great here. So we don't really think these are causal, but if you look at the kind of on the right-hand side, uh, the 2018 and 19, you see that there seems to be, you know, 
an increase in out of district transfer um, in both years, maybe a slight dip in exit rates in year one, but it went back up in year two. So here's how we showed it to the districts in terms of leaving teaching altogether, exiting the district, and then transferring within the, the district to other schools. To Tom's point, we did want to call out what happened to the junior teachers, those in their first five years. And you can see, um, especially in year two, the probability of just leaving the, the teaching profession in, in partnership schools increased hugely um, in year two. Here's cohort two. Nothing significant, although that within district transfer bar is, you know, looks like there's a sizable but not significant decline. And here you have it for the early career teachers, also not significant. So we then asked teachers, what are your plans? Like, okay, so this is from our survey. We've seen our models and we said, what are the plans for your future? Um, and we asked it in 2018 and 2019, 2018 is on the right, 19 is on the left. And you saw in 2018 um, that you know, the majority of teachers said they were gonna stay in the same position in their same school, about 60%, but that bumped to 72% in 2019. Now, we don't really know if that happened um, because this was 2019-20 school year. And we are just looking at the data now to see actually did teachers stay, but with the pandemic, we're not really sure how to attribute anything anyway, but it did look like there were some sort of planned intentions to have greater retention um, after the 2019-20 school year. So what was causing teachers to exit or teachers to stay? Leaders told us, you know, it's really about school leadership. This is a key factor in their decisions to stay in their schools. Um, they're seeing it thinking a difference. It's having people trust and have stable leadership. Um, they also felt that compensation and school leadership and workload were the most important factors driving teachers' decisions to leave. And we also have survey data on this as well. I'm not going to show it today for time. Um, they were trying to do things to improve working conditions and retain teachers. So they were focusing on um, teachers' time on co -work, core work, trying to take the extras out of their days and say, you know, maybe you don't do so much paperwork, let's focus on your instruction. Again, climate, recruiting school leaders, compensation, and focusing on teacher PD. Um, I have a couple of minutes. So here, here's again, just some other factors that were really important. Again, school leaders just came out over and over as the district superintendents telling us the school leaders are critical to being able to keep our teachers and improve our, our kids' outcomes. Funding was a huge issue. So whenever we talked to the districts about this, they really wanted us to stress, please don't say that we don't appreciate the funding. We appreciate the 21H funds. We need it, right? Um, especially the smaller schools and districts, like the charter schools and the smaller districts were saying, look, this money actually can go pretty far. It can buy us a new math intervention, right? Um, it can help us do some targeted compensation incentives. Um, but they were saying it was definitely not enough. Again, this is six to seven million dollars a year. Um, and they were just saying, it's just, we can't do as much as we want to do with the money. Um, and they said, you know, this is a, from the STARS district leader. He said, I guess I'd say a good way to look at it is as far as budgets go so far, we budget around a half a million from outside money. That's a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of resources we need to sustain what we're doing. So I'd say, no, it's not enough. There was also some interesting miscommunication around how they could use the funds. The, in the intention had been to be very flexible. The districts didn't always understand that. And so there was some kind of frustration about they got to the end of the year and they needed to have spent their funding and they thought they couldn't have. And sort of NDE was like, you could have spent it. And so there was some attempts to kind of iron out this communication after this was surfaced. And then also MDE really worked to streamline some of the systems and processes. So they knew that there was sort of this frustration in the first year or two with, of the intervention and, and didn't seem like, it was a little bit sporadic. Um, it, it wasn't as sort of, clearly delineated as they wanted it to be. So they put into place these sort of review of goal attainment processes that were supposed to enable reflection. And we did hear from districts that it was that the RGA processes were really bringing the partners together to validate the work that they were doing, um, making them stop and reflect and review. And that they were able to use these RGA processes where they brought the MDE in, they brought the ISDs in, they brought partners in to be able to tell their stories. And so they felt like they were being given credit for the work they were doing, even if it wasn't showing up in test scores yet. But obviously there were still improvements to be made. And um, one of the things that came out in both years 
is that there was still a compliance type focus to this and they felt like they wanted to be less of a compliance exercise and more of a real support. And I think some didn't want to have to do it at all. And also sometimes there was variation in liaison quality, which led to some misunderstandings. So some liaisons seemed more clear or better able to help than others. So the last piece on this um, that I wanna show and then we're gonna take questions is how COVID has affected these communities. This is something that I really have been stressing in Michigan because um, just take a look at these numbers for a second. In April, um, in partnership districts, the case, the cumulative case rates per 100,000 people was about 332. In non-partnership districts, it was 63.5. In August, it was 1,234 cumulative cases per 100,000. In partnership districts, it was 491 in non-partnership districts. So in the beginning of the, of the virus, um, in the pandemic, partnership districts were five times harder hit than were non-partnership districts. And I was still two and a half times harder hit by August when the virus had gotten more expansive. These are the, the communities that were just, they're the most impacted all the time. And as we think about how we want to hold districts accountable or how to help them improve, I think we cannot separate it going forward from how they've been impacted by the pandemic and how we need to think about what supports mean for them going forward. And what's really interesting is these districts, based on what we coded all their plans in the spring, and these, these districts were doing a lot. So they were more likely to be remote, which makes sense given that they, um, that they uh, were being so hard hit and they remain so hard hit. They're more likely to be remote even now. Um, and they had a lot more trouble in transitioning to remote learning according to their teachers and principals. Um, but they were doing interesting things like they were doing more providing electronic devices and internet access than were the other districts in the state. And they were really working hard. These are all based on survey data from principals and teachers. They were working hard to um, try to offer students opportunities to really directly engage with their teachers and not just have this online content. And they were more likely to be offering PD about how to do distance learning than were other districts in the state. So they were the hardest hit, but they were also doing some of the more um, important activities than were other districts. And how do we actually achieve good, high-quality learning in this in the, during the pandemic? So this is my last slide. Um, policy implications. You know, one thing that I think we've been trying to stress, and I think MDE really has taken, and you know, they understand, is that patience is warranted. Um, school turn turnaround takes a ton of time, and maybe three years isn't the right time frame. And that we should. This doesn't seem like it's not working, right? And it seems like maybe it is working. And so we should give them more time to let it go and to see if we can help them continue to make improvements. Um, but they do need continued assistance with kind of everything, but also teacher recruitment and retention in, in particular. This has really been a struggle for them. And they do feel like they need more funding. And especially in the aftermath of the pandemic, we feel like this is something that we should be thinking a lot about is how do we funnel funds to the districts that are the lowest performing and the hardest hit. Whew. OK, those are my slides. I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see people's faces if they have questions. Uh, and I'd go ahead. I would love to hear anything, comments or questions. Great. So, so thanks, um, Catherine. Uh, now, for folks who have, have questions, remember, raise your hand um, and, uh, and um, I'll call on you. I, so I see two so far. Uh, Alexis, and then Chris. I'm sorry, I don't have my hand raised. I'm just clapping. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, sorry. Yeah, all right. Matt, that looks like a raised hand. Uh, Chris had his hand up first. Oh, okay. Chris. Thank you, Catherine. I was uh, good to hear the work you're doing. Um, I'm wondering in the comparison between like Detroit and the other systems that are involved in this work, it seems true that like the baseline performance in Detroit is like much lower than in some of these other systems, although they're getting like comparable treatment. Um, and so in the changes that take place in Detroit, is it more about students were not having access to certain things like curriculum and therefore we're seeing like larger gains because they're getting things for the first time that they weren't getting whereas like the other systems are trying to wrestle with like improving quality and like curriculum 
decisions, which seem like a harder thing to sort through? Yeah, that's a great question. A couple of things on that. Detroit actually wasn't the lowest performing of the districts. So um, you guys have all, maybe, maybe not. There was a big New York Times spread on it, followed Benton Harbor. Um, really like, it's, I've never, I mean, I've been into lots of districts in my life that are, you know, turnaround districts, never walked into a district like that before um, in terms of supports and resources and everything. So Detroit actually was towards the bottom, but not the most bottom. So that's one clarification. Two, um, don't forget that we are comparing Detroit partnership schools to Detroit non-partnership schools. So all the things that were happening in Detroit, like curriculum being implemented and like teacher raises. I mean, the, Dr. Beattie walked in and really worked with the unions to improve teacher salaries. That was happening across the board, not just the partnership schools. And so we had the same question you had of, well, what is it about the partnership schools in Detroit that are different from the non-partnership schools that are also very low performing? Um, and if you go back to the first year report, you see Dr. Beatty talking about, you know, these are the schools that needed the most, like just empirically needed the most. And so when he was redistributing things, he really tried to say, let's, let's focus on this, this set of schools first. Let's make sure we're getting the right people, the right adults into these schools. Let's make sure that we're putting literacy supports into these schools. And so to some extent, you're right in that they didn't have a lot before, and this is the first time they were getting a lot of this stuff, but there was still like a, um, an attempt to understand what these particular schools needed and to work with them to get those resources there quickly. So whether that would have happened in the absence of partnership, you know, it's, we don't know. Um, but we think it was in part because they were able to assess what was going on. And they actually did have quite a bit of community buy-in in Detroit um, and the school board as well. And so they were able to sort of um, think about how to target resources in that district. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Matt and then Peter. Thanks, Catherine. This was incredibly uh, interesting. So I've been thinking about um, these ELA effects that you found. Um, they were kind of impressive and un, I think conventional in the sense that like thinking about Beth Schuler and Kate Larnett, a fellow uh, peer fellow and others who have this meta analytic review of turnaround strategies showing that ELL effects are, are generally small except for say Latinx populations or after years of turnaround or when there's like a teacher related reform. And you found these relatively large ELA effects. Um, and I just wondered if you could um, sort of shed some light on those and provide a little more context about why you think you're seeing those. Yeah. Um, again, so there's the, the Michigan wide explanation that I think I have. And there's the conversation about what is it about partnership schools different than non-partnership schools, which are so also low performing. So Michigan has put into place the read by grade three law, um, which is our version, many, I don't know how many, many, many states have this kind of um, third grade literacy. There's this terrible saying of, you don't, before third grade, you learn to read. And then after third grade, you read to learn. And all of my teacher friends tell me that's the worst thing to say, never say it, but that's the idea. Um, and so they put a ton of, they've been putting a ton of resources into literacy in Michigan. And even before the read by grade three, like read to achieve, exactly, it's exactly what it is. Um, and they were, so even before the read by grade three law, literacy has been just this huge topic in Michigan and there's been a ton of effort towards it. So in some ways, it's kind of comforting to see ELA gains in Michigan happening. And we also have, we're also the evaluators for the big grade three law with MDE. And so we're also seeing it in that evaluation over time. Um, and so while it is a little unconventional, we also think it kind of makes sense given what the curriculum has, the improvement efforts have been focused on in the state. Why partnership schools better than non-partnership schools is kind of a mystery, um, except for that, a lot of the PD in the state that was happening has been around how do you improve literacy? And if there's more PD going to the partnership schools as a result of the liaisons, the 21H funds, the RAG funds, the ISD coaches, it is possible that they are putting more effort into literacy because they have sort of more access to that capacity building than do other schools who aren't getting that kind of direct PD. Again, that's kind of a hypothesis. We don't really, we've been asking about it more and more to try to understand. So Peter and then Elizabeth. Catherine, thanks so much for really terrific work. Um, 
I had a question about like looking at some subpopulation analysis. Like, did you do the event study by looking, let's say specifically at minorities within the school districts? Like one of the major points that you made in framing the paper was how these schools tend to be particularly minorities. And then this kind of like links to like a second question, which has to do with like, how are the compositions of these schools changing over time? Like are students leaving en masse and are there particular students who are leaving versus not leaving? And this may have to do with kind of like the salience of this program. Like if I know that my school has been labeled as a kind of a turnaround school, then maybe it's just the labeling itself could have some element of a stigma there. And the, yeah. the other kind of like quick methodological piece is like, um, like does a synthetic control approach like help you to match some of those pre-trends? Like, if not in the aggregate, like maybe like within like certain subpopulations, if there is some like sorting over time. Um, okay, let me take those in order. <laughs> the subpopulations we, um, we have not done, it is on our list to actually look at those and then to also to look at achievement gaps within the districts. Um, that would be really interesting. It's a little difficult because some of these districts are so heavily uh, traditionally disadvantaged groups or minorities, you know, that we don't, sometimes there's not a, like, there's not a lot of variation within a district to look at. Um, but that is on our list. In terms of um, mobility, we did look at mobility. We don't see like huge exodus from those schools or districts or huge in, you know, influxes into those schools or districts either. Um, that was one of the things we first thought about is like, are people leaving? And we also, by the way, should say in Michigan, we have a pretty robust um, school choice system, not just, by use robust generously, um, not just charter schools, but also we do have inner district choice here. And so it actually is real potential that districts could be, or schools could be shedding kids to go to neighboring districts. And in fact, we did see that in Benton Harbor before the onset of partnership and Detroit too, before the onset of partnership. It hasn't looked like the partnership schools have seen more of that than non-partnership schools. Um, in terms of synthetic control, we have not looked at that. It actually, after talking to Luke today in our meeting, I had it as a note that we should be thinking about it for this project too. Um, so I will keep you posted as to if that helps. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, thank you, Peter. So Elizabeth, then Andrew, then Eric. Thanks so much, Catherine. Really interesting talk. I was wondering, since you have so much experience with other turnarounds, if you could and, and you also mentioned that the resources um, seemed insufficient for the districts. Uh, if you could put into context for us, kind of, is this a particularly generous or not generous um, turnaround policy relative to others that you're familiar with? So I feel like turnaround, the dirty secret of turnaround is it's often tried to be done on the cheap, right? So there's a lot in all the turnaround programs not all, but in many of them across the country, they have these big expectations and very quick turnaround expectations for schools. And they often do not fund it in ways that would be assumed to be helpful toward achieving that goal. That being said, this is very underfunded relative to, I think, even the general population of turnaround districts in the, in the country. Um, Beth might know more about the details than I do, but um, my understanding is this is very low funding and, um, you know, Michigan has uh, a history of underfunding at schools, and this is just one more example of, of that. Andrew, and then um, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. This is um, such a wide ranging sweeping presentation and such great work. I really enjoyed it. Um, you, you snuck a, um, an offhand comment about gain scores into your presentation. And you know, I, I just can't help myself on this. So um, it was so interesting that you, know, you presented results both ways and you said gain scores were more accessible. And so you uh, focused on those. And I just wanted to sort of get behind the scenes on that a little bit, because obviously, as you know, gain scores are less precise, right? And oftentimes what we do instead is we call the residual gain scores, we just call those gain scores and hand wave over them because of their technical, uh, relative technical defensibility in some cases. So I was just wondering if you could, how did you sort of navigate this trade-off between technically useful, but maybe less accessible on the one hand and technically fraught and, but maybe more accessible on the other? Yeah, so and a couple things on that, and that's a great question. Um, we rely fairly heavily on this like Immerman idea of the gains and the levels almost banned, what we think of the true estimate is. Um, and so we talk about it that way with our policymaker friends a lot. Like we think about this, and if we can get something similar on both, we feel more confident than if we like see something hugely divergent. 
Um, so that is very clear. So what's interesting is there's been so much conversation. This is my assumptions. So I've never said to them, why do you think this is more clear? But um, I think there's been so much conversation around the, the fact that gains are better for like accountability systems, right? And so we don't want to think about proficiency levels. We want to think about gains. We don't think about just, you know, levels and scores, but you could that just so conflated with income, et cetera. So I think that that has been driven in pretty deep, deeply into some of the policymaking conversation that when we talk about levels, even when you talk about controlling on the right-hand side, like that's a, that's a regression conversation as opposed to saying like, yeah, no, no, we're looking at gains, right? We do this. So it's the same thing. And we also do the other way that we think is really important and we see very similar results. And that's kind of how we, we capture it. We don't go into the technical <laughs> very much with, you know. <laughs> we do have a great, actually, as I said, MDE has a really strong group of IRT folks who do the assessments. And so we do kind of geek out with them a lot, but um, they're not always in the room for like these presentations. So we're going to do two more questions and then wrap up. So Eric and then Ebony, and then I, I think we've got to wrap up. Uh, Catherine, lo lots of things to think about. W one of the things that you mentioned was this hypothesis that like, because there's so much turnover in these schools, uh, that makes it difficult to, to implement sort of the kinds of changes that they might be hoping to implement. So the average rates of turnover are very high, but I wonder if you could tell us anything, I'm sorry if I missed it, if you said it already, about the variation among the turnover schools in that rate and whether there's any opportunity, have you tried um, to see whether the variation in the baseline turnover rates in those pre-years predicts the effects? Hmm. I have not thought to see if the baseline variation in turnover rates predicts effects, but I will. Thank you for a great idea. Um, so that's great. I do, so a couple of things. One, it's not a hypothesis. It's actually in our, from our first year study, we were told that by a ton of districts. I mean, they would sort of look at us like we were idiots and then walk us through like, what happens when you have turnover to this level? It's not just that I don't have a great teacher in every classroom. It's, and then they would walk us through like the trickle down effects. And I'm really embarrassed as someone who studied labor markets my entire career, but I had never thought about it that way. I'd never thought like, I can't ask them to implement a high quality curriculum with a ton of PD if they're retraining teachers every year. Um, so that was, I think kind of maybe everyone else in this room has realized that before, but for me, it was sort of an aha moment of like, yeah, turn around is extra hard for this reason. Um, in terms of variation in baseline, that's a really great idea and we will do it and I will report back. Thanks. So Ebony. Hi, Catherine. Hi. I hadn't meant to bring the conversation full circle, but the universe worked it out that way. Good for me. Um, and so this is a question going back to thinking about the work of the liaisons. Um, and some of the other work that you've done has really helped me think about the way technical assistance happens inside districts and how that might matter. I mean, I think one of the things we've learned, at least I learned in this presentation is that, and in your other work, is that you can do different things or liaisons can help districts do different things. And one of those things is to stop paying attention to things they used to pay attention to. Um, and I'm just wondering of the work that you've done with this set of turnaround schools, do you notice things that they've stopped doing? Like a lot of this is about attention or focusing on new things. Are there things they're not doing anymore that you think play a role in how they've changed and improved? That's a really great question. So in conversations that are not like data collection conversations that are just more casual conversations with the liaison sometimes, um, they have said to us things like, we really try hard to get them to focus on the important things, or we really try hard to get them to forget about, you know, there was a big thing around attendance when I first got to Michigan and they were saying, you know, put yard signs in your, all the yards in the community, like encouraging people to, and they were saying, we're trying to get them not to do these like band-aid things, but to think more deeply about. So I think in that sense, I've got some sort of anecdotal data. I don't know if we have good rigorous qualitative data on what they, but I think it's a great question we should start including is like, what did you tell them to cease? Like, what did you tell them wasn't worth their time? Because um, you're right, that is a really important sort of opposite side of how you think about how we should think about helping districts to think through improvement processes. I like that. 
So um, thanks, Catherine. And, you know, I, I'm sure um, there are a number of other questions that, that folks have, but I, I just wanted to just e extend my gratitude for, for you joining us for this seminar, which uh, um, was fascinating. And I'm sure people will have lots of other uh, questions. Um, uh, but I just wanted to thank you. So could we do some kind of virtual clap thing? And I should say, like, we're always looking for comments and suggestions on this work. It's an ongoing study. So we would welcome anyone's comments and suggestions as you have them. Please do send them our way. Um, and in, in closing, I, I just wanted to um, say that our next peer public seminar will be February 23rd. So just a couple of weeks from now with, uh, with uh, Ben Castleman um, uh, from University of Virginia. He'll be presenting on cash for college apps, the effects of conditional cash transfers on selective college enrollment. So um, thank you everybody. Uh, and thank you, Catherine. Um, and, uh, and a subset of us will be um, convening afterwards. All right, so thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, and all doctoral students and peer fellows that will be staying for the director's cut.